Okay so how's everyone? I know I've been pretty lazy so I'm gonna upload with a schedule hopefully alright let's begin. Chapter 27. The Prophecy of the Apocalypse. Azazel calmly observed the night sky, until he caught how a purple magic circle appeared behind him. They finally arrived, she thought aloud, while she looked at the apparition of Issei and his two future lovers. And the others. He asked the chestnut instantly, seeing that Rias and his entourage weren't there, not even Sirzex. Sirzex is entertaining them in hell, was Azazel's simple answer. This is a meeting that does not require your presence. They would only pester you with questions. I notice the presence of three very strong angels inside, commented Penemu, fixing her gaze on Azazel. So, they didn't take a second to come, huh? After hearing Penemu's words, Issei couldn't help but remember what they talked about in the past about a very important prophecy. The brown-haired man couldn't help but look at his katana with some intrigue after remembering the talk. I am aware that Tiamat knows nothing of this, Azazel commented, making the dragon stare at him. But, as one of the three most powerful entities, I find it interesting that you find out about this. Azazel raised a hand towards the door, inviting them inside. Come on. Meanwhile, in the underworld. Are you okay with this, brother? Rias asked, receiving an exhausted look from the Mao. There's nothing to do. We tried to delay the inevitable, but it was more than obvious that at any moment they were going to look for him. Sirzex commented, implying that he had no regrets. Besides, thinking about it coldly, we still have a lot of time to achieve our goal. Now that you know about the prophecy, we just have to be a little more careful with our movements so as not to be so obvious. Sirzex fixed his gaze on his sister, making her a little nervous. That's a part of your mission. Speaking of which, while we're here, it would be great to go over the points of our plan again, the Mao declared, placing both hands on the desk as he looked at everyone in Ria's entourage. Going back to Kuo Academy, Issei entered the main doors of the club, slightly widening his eyes in great disbelief as he witnessed three people shining in a divine and incomprehensible way. They simply had an impressive aura around them, which was a bit imposing, but at the same time it delicately embraced you. It was just a strange but nice feeling. There were three entities. In the center, stood a man with the strongest aura of the three, thus making him seem like the leader. His light blue eyes gave her a compassionate and friendly look. He had the appearance of being a good guy, as well as perhaps the most handsome he had ever seen, due to his perfect and refined features. At his side, there was a man with golden hair and eye color the same as before. Unlike his apparent leader, he had a somewhat dismayed expression, looking this way and that, as if he were a kid in a toy store. The man fixed his gaze on the brunette, giving him a huge grin between teeth that made him feel a little strange. It was only natural, considering that this subject seemed quite strange. And on his other side, it was incredible, a woman who was almost as tall as the guy in the center. He was extremely similar to her apparent leader. The only thing that differentiated him was her completely innocent look, which only intensified with her tender aura. When he saw Issei, she gave him a cute smile, even though they were natural enemies of hers. Another obvious difference was that she was a woman, and a rather well-endowed woman. Somehow, she rivaled Penemu when it came to the size of her breasts. In fact, Issei was able to distinguish with great ease that this woman was the perfect counterpart of the Kadri. The woman averted her gaze from Issei for a short second, fixing it on her side. Penemu, Azazel, long time no see. I really miss you, the woman commented with an angelic and completely pure voice, indicating that each word was more than sincere. Penemu simply responded with a wave raising her hand, making Issei reinforce the idea that this woman was the perfect counterpart of the Kadri. Even so, Issei didn't have much more time to think about it, as he watched as Azazel practically crawled towards the woman, making a bouquet of flowers appear from a magic circle. Oh, beautiful Gabriel, she exclaimed taking one of her hands and kissing it without her consent. I've been waiting for you all these years. Quote dot dot dot. Gabriel. Wait. The brown-haired man thought, blinking at the revelation and fixing his gaze on Penemu, where he is, he answered her with a nod, confirming his doubts. Any woman would respond with disgust to such an act, but Gabriel, being Gabriel, it was simply impossible for her to take Azazel's hint, not a hint, towards her. He only acted from his innocence, when he bent down and stroked her hair with his tender smile on his face. 
I've missed you for all these years, too. She exclaimed with complete innocence and sincerity. Without you, Elysium has been very boring. This only made Azazel hug her tightly, in which the Archangel did not hesitate to respond to her gesture. Elysium. The chestnut wondered aloud. It is known as heaven or paradise to humans. Penemu replied, receiving a nod from Issei. Gabriel is one of the most beautiful and pure women in the whole world. Tiamat commented, seeing Azazel's reaction. She is the main reason hundreds of angels have fallen. The dragon fixed her gaze on Penemu. She, and you. Seeing that the brunette wanted to find an answer, Penemu placed a hand on his head affectionately. When I was in heaven, she and I were identical. The only difference between us was the color of our hair and eyes, along with my height. Later, regarding personality, tastes, thoughts. We were the same in every aspect. Gabriel looked up, giving Penemu a nice smile as he continued to comfort Azazel. That made us very good friends back then. Issei looked at Penemu and Gabriel for a short second, unable to believe what he had heard. Can the fall of an angel really change your life that much? She couldn't help but think about the chestnut, since now they were both completely opposite. Michael could only smile nervously at Azazel's attitude, sharing the look with his companion. A few seconds later, everyone seemed to have calmed down, so the angels decided to introduce themselves to Issei, who still didn't seem to be entirely clear about who they were. My name is Michael. I've been in charge of Elysium since my father's death, God. Michael pointed to the woman next to him. As you already know, she is Gabriel. Along with me, she is an archangel, one of the strongest in her position. Michael pointed to the other side of her, causing the as yet unidentified man to raise his hand in greeting. He is Dulio Gaswaldo, an ancient exorcist who reincarnated as an angel thousands of years ago. Ah, despite having been a human, his fighting strength is comparable to ours. He was also known to be my joker until he became independent due to his great power. Joker. She thought about the chestnut for a short second, and then remembered one of the first talks she had with Diedrake. He's the first example I've seen of a reincarnation other than by devils. Once introduced, I would like to tell you the reason for our visit. Hearing this, Issei couldn't help but stare at the Sky Leader with special attention. Seeing the brunette's reaction, Michael couldn't help but become serious for the first time in the talk. Apparently, you already have a bit of an idea about this. Penemu had spoken to me a little, the brown-haired commented, causing everyone without exception to look at her with great surprise. Azazel fulfilled his part of the bargain. She commented the cadre quickly, seeing certain disappointed glances begin to turn his way. He never commented anything about it. It was our own father who told me about the prophecy, just before his last battle. Penemu couldn't help but look down with a certain sadness after remembering it. Hearing the answer, Michael and the others seemed instantly satisfied. Very well. It is normal for our father to have told the prophecy to what would previously be his successor. Michael's comment took the brunette completely by surprise, since he didn't know anything about it. Why is Penemu supposed to have been his successor? Changing the subject, it's obvious that they shouldn't have all the information we have about her. That's why we came to take Issei. Hearing this, Tiamat went on the defensive almost instantly. What are they going to do? The dragon asked, taking a step forward. I didn't believe that the rumors of the alliance between the Ice Queen and the Sekriote were true because of their eternal rivalry. But the impossible means nothing nowadays. Michael commented, giving her a small smile. Don't worry, we promise nothing will happen to him. Besides, it will only take a few minutes. Tiamat took a step back, holding her arms. Very good. Hum, are you sure? She couldn't help but ask the chestnut, seeing that the dragon's always hostility seemed to be practically in short supply right now. Tiamat looked at Issei with a small smile that denoted her precious fangs. Don't worry. Los Angeles can't lie, she explained, placing a hand on the chestnut's hair and rubbing it affectionately. Well, as you know, the protocols prevent us from bringing any demon human, fallen angel, or any other species to Elysium. Michael ducked his head from him, along with the other two. I hope you know how to apologize. No problem, was Azazel's simple answer, while he cleaned his ear with his little finger and did everything possible not to look at Gabriel. Hang on a minute, Issei pointed. I am a demon. You are the exception. Upon hearing Dulio's answer, 
the brown-haired man couldn't help but look at him with great intrigue. You'll understand in the moment. Michael explained, holding out his hand. Come on. Issei looked towards his two future lovers, who nodded to him, as did Azazel. Finally, the brown-haired man took the archangel's hand, causing the aforementioned to widen his smile. Gabriel, if you want, you can stay until we get back. She responded quickly, making the pout on Gabriel's face instantly disappear into a huge smile. That, Dulio exclaimed. Wait, I want to stay a while too. He begged himself, causing Michael to take his hand. You are coming with us. It was Michael's simple response, making Dulio do the impossible to get away, while comical tears appeared on his face. Following that, a strong golden light graced the club for a short second, and when it disappeared, three people were already missing there. Sister, I missed you so much. Gabriel practically pounced on Penemu, hugging her tightly. Oh, yes, were the only words that came out of the cadre's mouth, as she felt how she was squeezed and squeezed by her best friend from the past. Meanwhile, in a rather, singular place, to put it in some way. After the blinding glare, Issei opened his eyes, and couldn't help but be immensely surprised by what he was seeing. Everything was completely white. He was standing on top of some clouds, or at least, they seemed to be. The solidity was so empty that it seemed like it was floating above the ground, as if it weren't really stepping on anything. What seemed to be clouds extended infinitely, where you could see different structures made of walls with a golden glow, in what were supposed to be the homes of the beings that lived there. The atmosphere, unlike hell, shared a lot of similarity to the mortal plane as far as color is concerned. The only strange thing is that there weren't any hints of clouds around, although perhaps it wasn't so strange, since they seemed to be stepping on the clouds directly. Next to him, the brown-haired man could distinguish how there was a small hole, and in that place, it seemed to be an infinite fall, since it was completely dark below. Nothing seemed to exist below, except for a wall of golden magic circles that covered the entire bottom surface. It was probably to keep the huge structure afloat, and perhaps for yet another function. Issei stopped admiring the whole environment, when he felt how Michael placed a hand on his shoulder. It's nothing like what you've been seeing so far, right? The archangel asked, receiving a quick nod from the brunette. Follow me. Issei instantly complied, following behind him, while Dulio watched him non-stop. The magic circles below were created by God. It is what keeps this realm afloat, and also serves as the passage to earth, for those who gave into sin. Michael explained, as Issei watched as each angel seemed to be enjoying life here. These clouds were also created by my father. If you have impure desires that begin to adorn your heart, your body will feel heavier and heavier, until these clouds can no longer support your weight, and finally, you fall. Due to the magical density of the environment, it is impossible to fly, Michael stopped there, fixing his gaze on Issei with great curiosity. However, I was really hoping that I would have to use a magic circle to allow you to move around here, but I see that it wasn't necessary. It's quite intriguing, being a devil. Dulio perched next to Issei, making the brunette jump a little. Does that mean that the disappearance of the demonic corruption is official? He asked, putting a hand to his chin. There are rumors that because of the death of God and the demon king, the forces of the divine and the corrupt have greatly declined. Actually, demonic corruption does still exist, just like original sin, the brunette quickly explained, rubbing his hair with a nervous smile at the angel's carefree attitude. What happens, is that I am lucky to have Deidre, who prevented my soul from being corrupted after reincarnation. I see, Dulio commented, getting closer to the brunette, piercing him with his gaze. I never would have imagined that, a dangerous glint ran through his eyes. And tell me, how has humanity progressed? Are the girls today prettier than the ones before? Uh, well, Issei looked genuinely taken aback by the sudden question. Let's just say that the makeup products help a bit, the brown-haired man didn't know how to continue the conversation. Dulio, didn't you have to do something? Michael asked, causing the aforementioned to move away from Issei immediately. It's true. Dulio bumped his fist into his palm. I have to watch the second bubble of human souls. He commented to no one in particular, disappearing in a flash, without first giving a quick wave. I'm sorry. Michael bowed his head, delivering his apology, impressing Issei. As you already know, he is not an angel as such. 
He has been very curious about human life ever since he left him. And let's say that when he was an exorcist, he had a great interest towards beauty, especially the beauty of women. An interest, which still hasn't disappeared nowadays. No problem. Really. Issei quickly waved his hands at him, feeling slightly uncomfortable that the leader of the angels bowed his head to him. They both continued walking for a few seconds, where Michael presented him with a kind of giant capsule, where there were a large number of human souls living with each other. He explained to her that this is the so-called paradise mentioned in the Bible, and that is where all the pure and kind souls end up. He also explained to her that before the death of God, evil or corroded souls had their memories erased, and they entered a new body. At least, it was like that until the death of God, now they just destroyed them. Issei was left with the question of what was the cause of changing the system, but he kept the question to himself, feeling that the question would be answered very shortly. Finally, they parked at a small home, which turned out to be the house of God himself. It was curious, since all the home structures were exactly identical, except for the structures that stored the pure human souls. When he entered, the first thing he distinguished was a small golden structure, where it seemed that too many things were regulated. This machine was used by God, to create angels, human souls, clean said souls, create sacred gears, and among other very important things. The archangel commented, lowering his head with a slight sadness. Unfortunately, no one on Elysium possesses that much power to use the projector. That is why the creation of angels stalled, and for that reason, we can only destroy the evil souls of humans, while we can only pray that they continue to reproduce without problems so that they continue to subsist organically. It's curious to see that this small element has killed infinitely powerful beings, like me and Albion. Diedreg commented, a little impressed by the fact. We didn't finish them. We just sealed them. Michael corrected, without detracting from the great power of dragons. Something that obviously made Diedreg happy made him like her a bit. Michael opened one of the doors, fixing his gaze on Issei. Anyway, this wasn't what she wanted to show you. He gave her a small nod, signaling for her to follow him. Issei did so, reaching a rather small room, where a rather small white and gold structure stood in the center, where it had different strange symbols in the center, at the same time that it had a Hebrew script on top. What distinguished our father was not his immense power, but his skill. The archangel narrowed his eyes slightly. He was able to see the future. Hearing this, the brunette froze completely still. Beer, el futuro. That's how it is. Michael nodded. For that reason, he would make various prophecies of what the future might be like. And, if so, how to change it. Or at least, we could safely make a change, even after his death. After all, messing with the future can be quite dangerous. Michael positioned himself next to what appeared to be a small relic, positioning his hand over the writing. The prophecy of the apocalypse, he uttered, causing the brunette to widen his eyes in shock. A reluctant future, where only the end awaits the demons and the fallen angels. The angels, the Nordics, and the yokai will suffer the worst cataclysm in their history. Three thousand years remain, so that the life of every living being is at stake. W. Wait. Issei tried to interrupt, but Michael stopped him instantly. The symbols belong to each faction, and the order is indicated by the importance of each one in the last battle. Michael started with the latter. This is us, the angels. Of the approximate 40,000 that we are now, it is estimated that some 2,036 survive. Michael passed his hand over the next symbol. These are the fallen angels. Of the approximate 35,000, it is estimated that two survive. He stopped at the next circle, looking at it with great attention. These are the Nordics. Of the 20,000, 15,000 will survive. Keep in mind that today, the Nordic army only numbers 8,000, and the rest are citizens. Michael continued to the next circle, frowning slightly. In this case, it is not the participation of a faction, but of an entity. This is the Hakuryuko, where its survival is anyone's guess, just like the other singular entities. Michael continued parking his hand on the other circle, unable to help but narrow his eyes. Surprisingly, the devils have an even bigger share. But, the total of survivors, is zero. Hearing the number, Issei felt like he froze. The third, belongs to Ophis, and the second to Great Red. I don't understand, the brunette commented. Why are you telling me something so important? 
Michael positioned his hand over the last symbol. Because you are the most important in this battle, Issei. The Sekiriote, is the one who will decide the future. Issei was completely at a standstill, trying to absorb all the recently gathered information. Would he have to carry the weight of saving the whole world? Was it some kind of joke? But, don't take it so personally. Michael exclaimed, seeing that Issei didn't seem to respond to such information. The prophecy indicates the beginning of the end in 3,000 years. A thousand years have already passed, so there are still 2,000 years to go. Furthermore, it is also specified below that he will be the last existing Sekiriote, so you need not worry. The last Sekiriote, Issei couldn't help but ask, getting a quick nod from Michael. We don't know how it will happen, but we are sure that the wearer will have to sacrifice himself along with Deidre to succeed, or at least, we speculate something similar. Something that should destroy the boosted gear completely, and take Deidre's soul with it. Seeing that Issei began to fill with melancholy, the archangel quickly approached and placed a hand on his shoulder. You don't have to worry. The average lifespan of an Albion or Deidre bearer is equivalent to the lifespan of a human warrior due to the great battles they lead. To be honest, I don't think you should face such a responsibility, since there is still a long time to go. I brought you here, because I think the chances of you ever facing it are very low, but they are there. Stats were born to be broken, was Deidre's simple reply, impressing Michael immensely, as he hadn't expected the dragon to jump into support almost instantly. The dragon hoped that his words could have made the chestnut happy, but he became bitter and worried when he felt that nothing changed inside his body. Before you come back, I must show you one last thing. A door opened, causing Issei to direct his downcast gaze there. Behind that door, there is a message from my father that is addressed solely to the Sekiriote. None of us have ever entered there, as we are not allowed to. We don't know what the message is, and we don't have any clues either, as all the previous bearers couldn't understand the meaning behind it, though some didn't even try, due to the trust they had in its power. Michael fixed his gaze on Issei with great seriousness. That you didn't need a magic circle to be transported here speaks volumes for you. I think you're the best bearer to see this message so far, and perhaps you can find some meaning. Issei looked at Michael for a short second, then nodded. Perhaps, there I could find an answer on how to prevent the death of many. Before you go in, I want to tell you something. Issei stood in the doorway, fixing her gaze on Michael. My father's prophecies do not encrypt destiny, only the future. That is why, depending on how said prophecy is taken, the future can fluctuate. How many times has it fluctuated? The brown-haired asked, causing Michael to become slightly serious after remembering the only antecedent. It was only once. It was the simple response of the archangel, receiving a nod from the brown-haired man. Issei entered the room noticeably larger than the previous ones, where you could see that it was a type of living room, with many chairs and a large round table in the center. Issei just walked a bit to the side, looking at the room in detail, unable to find anything interesting. Finally, her gaze fixed on a kind of orographic player in the center of the table, which came off a figure of a man who seemed to be around 38 years old, already with a couple of gray hairs and a golden beard. His golden eyes stared at nothing, while he seemed to be very doubtful. Okay. Let's get this started. God closed his eyes for a short second, looking out the nearby window. This is a screening, so I won't be able to answer any questions. Just listen, please. Issei just leaned against the wall, listening carefully to the projection. Today is probably the last day of my life. I saw the future and shared my wisdom and fate with all the other people on how to stop Trihexa. We just needed to appease her anger so she could come to her senses again, her only weakness, God lowered his head, taking a deep breath. I never thought that my own children would use that information against us, just for wanting to extinguish all other species in order to dominate. My son, the demon king, how could I be so blind? God looked up from him, giving a small sigh. Well, there's nothing to do now, God lowered his head slowly. The future has fluctuated and there is only one way to stop Trihexa. Unfortunately, I will have to sacrifice myself. God looked up from him, narrowing his eyes a little. But it will only be for momentary peace. I have seen who the Sekiriote is, I have chosen it myself after seeing its provenance. Even so, I prefer not to specify it. 
I will not make the same mistake twice. Finally, God approached the window, and looked out. A small smile appeared on his face. Apparently, he was seeing his children. In closing, I would like to tell you one thing, if you are the chosen Sekariote. God returned to Sirius the glance of him. There are only two beings who know about your identity, and only those two people will help you at the key moment. I evoke all my faith in them, and for the future that I am dazzling, I think I have not been wrong. God lightly clenched his fists behind his back. I'm worried there's another fluctuation, but I also have faith that everything will go according to plan. God took a deep breath, closing his eyes deeply. I know you won't understand this at the moment. But, to be honest, the only thing I hope in this screening. The only thing I hope is that you can forgive me. Issei could only slightly widen his eyes, when God turned around, and seemed to fix his gaze on him just before the projection ended. Something very curious, since it was just that, a projection. After a few minutes, Michael quickly approached the chestnut, seeing that it had finally come out. From the look on his face, he knew that he had been debating the information quite a bit. Did you get anything? Michael asked, making Issei wince a little. I just understood that if I am the Sekariote, I should meet two people who know everything about the future. Was the brown-haired's response, making Michael make a small face, indicating that they had already told him about that. Also, during the screening he seemed to be very hurt by the betrayal of his son, the Demon King. It is normal, was Michael's quick response. The betrayal stemmed from the beginning of the Great War, when the demons wanted to proclaim themselves the sole dominant species. But during the battle against the Trihexa the differences had been put aside. Issei's comment made Michael look at him with great intrigue. What do you mean? She asked. I mean, he seemed sad about something recent. That answer made Michael slightly surprised. Though, I don't know exactly what he was referring to. He doesn't specify. Michael lowered his gaze, thinking carefully about her words. I see. He looked up from him, staring at him. But, I think it's somewhat absurd what you're raising, since the Demon King himself was the one who provided great help to God together with Ophis and Great Red to seal Trihexa. In fact, he died together with God to achieve the task. It's just a hypothesis. After all, it's what I thought I saw, was Issei's simple comment, making Michael not press any further, because he looked quite depressed with all the recently undermined information. Michael decided to leave the interrogation aside, seeing that the brunette didn't seem to be doing very well. Do you want to take some time to absorb everything? She asked her, receiving a nod from the brunette. Let's go to a quiet place. Meanwhile, at Kuo Academy. So, the odds of a chaotic future are closer than we think, Tiamat commented, already having been apprised of the situation. There are still 2,000 years to go. We can still prepare and train him with no problem. Penemu commented, receiving a quick nod from Tiamat. But, it will be 2,000 years from now. They all looked at Gabriel, not understanding exactly what he meant. I mean, the average lifespan of a Sekariote doesn't exceed 35. Most likely he, will not die. Tiamat and Penemu stomped their feet, sounding out their words with great authority. Gabriel could only shut up at such timing and tone. I didn't want to mention it either, but, Azazel thought, looking up seriously. 2,000 years is a long time for a Deedrade wielder, you brat. Back in Elysium, Issei sat down on one of the many golden benches that were on the site, while holding a very deep thought. If your previous carriers came before, why didn't you tell me about it? The brunette asked, making Deedrade sneer slightly. You know very well that my relationship with my previous carriers was never good. I spent most of my journey sleeping with them. It's normal that I didn't find out about this. The dragon commented, causing Issei to lower his gaze a little more. Right now, Deedrag's concern was sky high. Knowing that he must sustain so many lives, that he will probably die during the final battle, and even die before that. After all, it was still 2,000 years away from that. Sometimes the reality checks are much stronger than one expects. At least, that's what Deedrag believed. And indeed, those things worried him. But, they were in the background, compared to his real concern. Partner. Diedrag began to search for words to lift his best friend's spirits. Diedrag, I don't want you to die. The chestnut spoke first, leaving no response time for the dragon. 
Diedrich could only slowly widen his eyes in complete shock. Of all things. Of all the worries. Of his possible death. Of all the burden. Was he just noticing that little detail? In his death. Diedrich could only close his eyes deeply, at the same time that a big smile appeared on his face. Seriously. You're amazing, brat. The dragon commented. Of all things, you only look at that. Just look at that. The brunette asked, looking down at him sadly. You're like a brother to me. Of course I'll take notice of that. Diedrich only increased his smile even more at what he heard. Listen, you're like a brother to me too, the dragons. Gaze became extremely serious, but you should also think about your future. Seeing that Issei didn't seem very convinced about that, the dragon began to recount. Tell me, what do you think Matsuda and Motohama would feel when they found out about your death? Issei's eyes widened slightly at the comment. What will your companions think? Diedrag narrowed his eyes slightly. What will Tiamat and Penemu think? Issei's eyes would widen even more at his last words. They would be devastated. A silence of a few seconds was present, until Issei finally decided to speak. Yo, I'm not saying that you only do it for them, for them, or for us. Diedrag interrupted him, his voice rather relaxed. You must also do it for yourself. After all, wouldn't you like to enjoy hundreds of years in the proximity of Tiamat and Penemu? Don't you mind dying before, knowing all that you could enjoy with them in the future? Seeing that Issei seemed to start to react, Diedrag couldn't help but smile. And they are just an example. You can still experience many things together with me, even with your companions. So, will you sit idly by? Issei leaned on the bench, looking down at his hands. A very determined look crossed her face, at the same time that she clenched her fists tightly. I'll survive, and I'll make sure you do too. The brown exclaimed with complete confidence. It doesn't matter if I have to sweat blood in every training. That's the spirit. Diedrag roared with great conviction, seeing that Issei had completely pulled himself together. Are you ready to go back yet? The talk was interrupted with the arrival of Michael, making the brunette look at him. I just have one question. She commented, making Michael look at him with special attention. Do reincarnations apply within each faction? She asked herself, causing Michael to shake his head. Not so. All races that possess reincarnations, or that are half-bloods, do not count in the numbers. Even so, it is specified that the extermination of fallen devils and angels happens almost entirely, so there should be no more D-survivors, bringing the two sides together, of course. Michael explained making the brunette lower his head from him. Just one last question before I go back. Hearing the gauntlet, both Issei and Michael were shocked. If Trihexa is supposed to cause the extermination, why doesn't her symbol appear in the prophecy? It's kind of funny, since she should be the one with the most involvement. After all, everything ends up being triggered because of her. Well, it is the prophecy of the apocalypse. His name may not appear, but he is the dragon god of the apocalypse, and it just coincides that the seal will be broken in approximately 2,000 years. Michael clarified. All clues point to him. A little. Hum. It was heard from the gauntlet, indicating that Diedrag had been satisfied with the answer. Before you go back, I would like you to promise one thing. Michael commented seriously, receiving a nod from the brown-haired man. I want this to remain strictly between us. Very few know about it and spreading such information to the entire supernatural world would be very dangerous. Chaos and panic could reign in different quarters if it were known. Meanwhile, in hell, we will take advantage of that fluctuation. The Sekariote is the fluctuation. Sears X commented with great seriousness. The Sekariote has great power in the coming war, and if we manage to use it carefully, we could survive such a catastrophe. And after the battle, Sears X would narrow his eyes with a mischievous look. We could take advantage of the weakness of the other races to be able to predominate over them, and control them. Sears X fixed his gaze on Rius with great seriousness. But all of that, depends on you, Rius. You have to control him through love, and keep him ignorant at all times. Sears X leaned back against his desk, opting for a passive gaze. So far, you haven't made any progress with it. Something that's understandable because you have spent very little time with the bear due to his training. But that's okay. Let's remember that we not only need control, but we also need it to be very strong. 
What if it turns out that he is not the Secariote of prophecy? Rias asked, causing Sirzex to look down from him, as he made a seal appear that had the engraving of the twelve gates of hell on it. We'd go to plan B. Sirzex couldn't help but narrow his eyes at the thought. Something I wouldn't want to do. Rias couldn't help but look at him in confusion, since he didn't know what his brother meant. And what about the fallen angels? Akino asked, making Sirzex look surprised at the cunning of the woman. Wow. I didn't expect you to notice, he commented, outlining a small smile. If the Sekariote is the biggest pawn in our plan, they are the smallest. After all, they're the only race that looks even a bit like ours. They'd be willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill their most repulsive desires. If we show them an idyllic way to victory, they'll surely join our side. That's why I called Azazel. That way, we'll start having more and more contacts with the fallen angels. Sirzex narrowed his eyes slightly, remembering the interactions he had with Azazel. Although he seems to have slightly different ideas than what he had thought at first. But it won't be anything that is difficult to solve. With a couple of women, he will surely be happy already, the Mao thought. From now on, it's time, Rias whispered, clenching her fist tightly. I promise not to let you down, brother. I am glad to hear that, the Mao commented with a smile. But remember that we still have a lot of time. Proceed carefully, and don't rush. Rias simply nodded at her brother's words, before disappearing in a magic circle along with her entourage. Sirzex leaned back against his desk, flashing a mischievous little smile. Telling all the pure fiends and certain exceptions about the prophecy was a very good idea. Even so, I don't think Michael was wrong in thinking that spreading the information could cause great chaos and panic ahead of time. He thought, then narrowed his eyes slyly. But, he doesn't remember that we devils were born out of chaos and panic. It's normal that he doesn't remember, because we've been hiding our true nature for a millennium to find an opening due to his overconfidence towards us. But, a wide grin appeared on the Mao's face. I never thought that he would have such an opportunity, having the Sekariote on my side. At Puo Academy, Issei and the others had already said goodbye to the angels, leaving them alone. Issei, are you all right? Tiamat asked with genuine concern, putting a comforting hand on his shoulder. Issei positioned his hand over hers, giving her a smile. After absorbing that information, I just feel like training. She commented, making Tiamat and Penemu smile at her, looking quite relieved. I can't believe I saw Gabriel again, Azazel thought aloud, making everyone look at him. With Penemu's change in attitude, no wonder she is the most desired and pursued woman by all. Tiamat glanced at her friend, sticking out her tongue. Apparently, those times when they were even are over. Penemu simply raised an eyebrow, indicating that she cared little for being less than Gabriel. Issei, what do you think? Azazel asked, making Penemu instantly fix his gaze on the brunette. Something that had no relevance in his mind, became very important from one second to the next. Which of the two is prettier? Azazel issued the ultimatum. Although, the answer was already decided before even formulating it. Penemu. She said it with complete confidence and practically at the second, causing everyone to be surprised. I like her type of character much more. And I think her beauty is more sporadic and special. Penemu could only blush at such words, and then look away. No one could make out that small victorious smile that appeared on her face. And he says it with such confidence. Azazel patted his face with a big smile. Hum. Issei just looked at him, not understanding why she had said the bad guy. Had he said something wrong in the first place? Well, Azazel burst into loud applause. With this crazy night, the training period ends. He concluded, to then outline a gloomy look, since he knew well that what was coming was not good. Especially, for a certain cadre. Issei couldn't help but look at Penemu with some pain, and she shared his gaze completely. They had both spent so much time with each other, having fun, sweating, playing, chatting, and sometimes crying, that they had completely forgotten that training didn't last forever. Tiamat could only watch without saying a word, as Penemu slightly lowered her gaze, while her crimson eyes gave off a quite palpable sadness in the environment. Penemu, the brunette extended his hand to comfort her, in which the cadre stopped him instantly. Issei. His rather melancholic voice caused a lump to form in the brunette's throat. Would you, 
would you like to play one last game of chess with me? She concluded, looking up. Issei wasn't going to deny her by any means, but those pleading eyes only made him want to rush towards her and hug her tightly for comfort. But he knew her well, and knew that she didn't like to display too many emotions in public. Issei held back from hugging her out of respect, to then nod firmly, making a tiny and imperceptible smile appear on Penemu's face. Meanwhile, Tiamat seemed to have been quite satisfied with the outcome. Apparently, I'll get rid of the explanation about my heat cycle for one more day. The dragon thought, happy for both of them. Azazel drew a half-smile on his face, seeing that the farewell was going to be much more pleasant than he thought at first. A few minutes later, at Grigori, the silence was palpable in the environment, since they were in the main hall, and as usual, no one would be working there late at night. Although to be honest, what would be unnatural is for someone to work in the first place. The chessboard made hollow sounds for each move, and for each piece that was knocked over. Nothing but those emotionless sounds were heard around, as both players were completely silent. Checkmate. It was Issei's simple words. He would be very happy to have beaten Penemu for the first time, who had played completely serious, but the situation did not allow it. Especially, because of the bitter face that Penemu had throughout the duel. I, Issei tried to start a conversation, but was quickly cut off as Penemu took his hand, making eye contact with him for the first time since they arrived at Grigori. Can you stay with me? Penemu tightened her grip on the brunette's hand even more. Just for tonight, please, he concluded her, with a very pleading tone. A small smile appeared on the brunette's face, seeing that Penemu had finally decided to fully open her emotions towards him at this moment. I'd love to, Issei responded quickly, giving her a big smile. Surely, no smile from Penemu had been as close to returning to its origins as this one. Her smile was so pure and delicate, denoting all her happiness upon hearing that Issei had accepted her proposal. It was such a beautiful smile that the brown-haired man couldn't help but file it along with the first smile Tiamat gave him when he said he would stay with her those three days. This is how they both went to sleep in the Kadri's room. On this occasion, Issei was not ashamed to look at her face, perhaps it was because of the situation, or because she was already irresistible enough in his eyes not to look at her especially when she was wearing her white pajamas, which made her look much more beautiful than normal. Penemu didn't take a second to get closer to him, snuggling her body a little together with the chestnuts. The distance between them was noticeable, but it was completely cut off by her deep neckline, which was pressed affectionately against the brunette's chest. She put her hands together and rested them on Issei's chest without saying a word. Both were content with breathing so close to each other. And not only that, the warmth she felt was also too nice to go unnoticed. Oh really? The silence was broken by a shy Penemu. Do you really think I'm prettier than Gabriel? Hearing the question, Issei couldn't help but chuckle internally. Although, that laugh was especially due to how Penemu twisted her body under the covers, indicating that she gave the answer non-existent importance. Penemu couldn't help but tense up slightly when she felt Issei's arms around her waist, enclosing her in a weak hug, but one that meant much more than that. Why do you worry about that? You are hundreds of times prettier than her. Penemu felt how a huge blush rose on her cheeks, because of the endless emotions that sprouted from the depths of her chest. Luckily, the complete darkness was on her side so that the brunette couldn't see her in those conditions. But, she couldn't help but act on such a compelling sensation. Issei couldn't help but blush slightly when he felt how the cadre used her legs to wrap around his waist. That didn't end there since he also wrapped his arms around the brown-haired torso, enclosing him in a hug so strong and warm that one could easily feel the other's heartbeat. Heartbeats that were perfectly in tune, as if both were connected. Because of your academy, and my job, we won't be able to see each other. The workload is quite dense for everyone, especially for me, the cadre commented with quite noticeable anguish, even her voice sounded a little broken. He never thought that distancing himself from someone could become so painful. I understand perfectly, the brown-haired commented, not knowing what to say about it. Don't say anything. Penemu's cracked voice deepened even more. Only, Issei couldn't help but feel how his heart began to tremble, because he felt how moisture was palpable on his shirt, indicating that Penemu had begun to cry. Solo Abrazane, he concluded, making the brown-haired man tighten his embrace on her even more 
feeling how tears threatened to come out of his eyes. But, he wanted to feel strong for once in his life. I wanted to be strong for her. The next day, and the dynamic brat, Azazel asked, seeing that Penemu entered the Great Hall, without Issei's company. He's already gone, was Penemu's curt response, sitting next to Azazel to start looking through the papers. Oh these hours of the morning. Azazel whistled. She must really like the academy. He commented to no one in particular, and then felt a bit surprised by Penemu's attitude. After all, she didn't have the usual monotony on her face, with her seriousness hiding her emotions. In fact, on this occasion, you could see from leagues away that he was suffering, and a lot. Azazel caught on almost instantly what was happening, so he stared at it for a couple of seconds, until finally a sly smile shot across his face. Oye, don't talk to me now. Penemu cut him down immediately. I'm trying to concentrate, and I don't have the mood to talk to anyone. Would you like to see Issei while you do your job in between? Penemu would have told him to shut up or she would kill him, but it was more than evident that those words had caused the cadre great interest. His penetrating, exclusive gaze directed solely at Azazel confirmed it. End of chapter. Chapter 28. On the beach next to a nice fall. Don't say anything. Just hug me. Issei made a small face after remembering everything that happened yesterday with Penemu. From her face, he clearly resented the fact that he had to get away from her, though he couldn't live tormented by it. The brown-haired man looked up, remembering from the first day he met her with that little accident when they collided, until the moments when she opened up to him and cried in his arms, narrating all her past and what she had suffered. Those thoughts ended during the fireworks, remembering her beautiful smile and the perfect contrast her beauty gave to what was happening behind her. They were vivid images of her that she could never forget. Issei's smile fell when he realized he was already in front of Kuo Academy, slightly startled. How long have I been thinking about? The brown-haired man quickly shook his head, entering the courtyard of the institution. Tiamat smiled at him from one of the third-floor windows, giving him a little wave, which Issei quickly answered. Issei. The brown-haired man couldn't help but divert his gaze when he heard someone shouting in the distance, seeing how some kind of stampede was approaching him at full speed. Issei. Motohama's voice quickly cleared, and just like that he also knew why his two friends were running so fast, because a few women were chasing them with wooden katanas. The two friends quickly positioned themselves behind the brunette using it as a human shield, causing Issei to roll his eyes. The women stopped right in front of him, giving him a dirty look. Are you going to defend them again, Hyodo, friend of the pervert duo? Katase asked. Issei couldn't help but make a stick face at his nickname. We were already too benevolent last time, but they don't learn. The same woman commented, taking a firm step forward. Either you get out of the way, or we'll have to beat you up too. Issei looked at his two friends, frowning at them and making them smile nervously. Finally, the brown-haired man gave a small sigh and closed his eyes. I think we could talk about. It's impossible to talk to those beasts. Murayama yelled, trying to punch Issei in the torso to get him out of the way. Everyone was shocked, including his own friends, when Issei stopped the attack dead with one hand. Murayama tried to move the katana, but it was impossible. Issei's hold on her was too strong. The brunette turned his face to look at her, opening his eyes in a somewhat tired way. Are you going to listen to me? Murayama gritted his teeth, using all his strength to try to move his katana, but it was impossible. He finally tripped back and fell, because Issei had opened his fist. Issei looked at all of them for a few seconds, seeing that they already seemed to be a little calmer, perhaps it was because of what they had just witnessed. It's true that her attitude is somewhat despicable, but, why do you defend them? Katais cut him off again, causing Issei to give her a piercing look. Because they are my friends. She answered as if it were the most normal thing in the world, but everyone noticed that those words carried more weight than it seemed. How can you be friends with the two of them? Murayama asked, carefully getting up as she gave the brunette a much more wary look. They're hopelessly filthy perverts. Seeing your personality, you should be around someone like Prince Charming. Issei couldn't help but feel a certain revulsion at Kiba's nickname, although he was almost completely over the fact that all the women at the academy noticed him, almost. Why do you only look at the bad side of other people, other than your Prince Charming? Issei answered with another question 
making all the women look at him strangely. They act like that because it's impossible for them to get a woman's attention, since they're not pretty faces, like Kiba. Outside of their perverted side, I'm sure they'd be better than all of you. Are you suggesting that a couple of perverts are better than us? Katase asked, unable to believe what she was hearing. All people have their good side, as well as their bad side. Issei stopped for a second, looking at her from head to toe. For example, are you going to tell me that it's not wrong to want to beat an innocent man to death just because he gets in the way? And what about me, if I saw you guys beating two people to death just for the mere pleasure of it? Do you think I wouldn't think you're violent and crazy shit? All the women lowered their gaze a bit just before what they heard. Why don't you ask them the reason for their actions, now that they are in front of you? Issei looked at the two friends of hers with a small smile. Talking to them and understanding them will make things better. Issei slightly serious her look. In the meantime, you guys should try to hold back that urge of yours a bit. I understand that you want to be with a woman, believe me. But it is not an excuse to act that way. And if you keep doing it, there might come a time when some woman takes advantage of you for that. The brown-haired man slightly clenched his fists at the memory of Rainair. I'm saying it for your own good, he said to both friends, making Matsuda and Motohama look at each other in astonishment. So, you're suggesting that either of us would fall in love with one of them if we understood them better? Murayama asked, clearly not believing what she was saying. Well, they say that in love, the most different people are the ones who end up loving each other the most. Or killing. He commented on the brunette rather gracefully, before looking at Matsuda and Motohama. Anyway, you guys might not be as different as you think, Murayama. Issei hunched his shoulders. Who knows? Katase and Murayama looked at each other, then nodded. Very well. We'll try to understand them, I think, Katase commented, clearly not too sold on the idea. The two women leading the angry mob glared at the perverts for a short second, then walked away. Issei. The brunette turned around when Motohama tugged on his shirt. Since when are you so wise? Matsuda asked, adjusting his glasses. Well, let's just say my thoughts became a bit clearer thanks to. Issei's gaze would immediately drop, making Matsuda and Motohama look a bit worried. A friend. A friend. Matsuda asked. Did something happen on the trip with your club? Surprisingly, Matsuda glossed over the fact that Issei was seeing a woman. Something like that. Issei commented, rubbing his hair. We had a woman of about 25 who was our guide, so to speak. She and I became good friends. Issei's smile fell again. But, I'm afraid it will be very difficult to see her again. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. Motohama commented with some regret, before adjusting her glasses. Sorry for asking. But was that woman you speak of attractive? Issei couldn't help but smile at the question since it had taken them a long time to ask it. Yes, and a lot, the brown-haired commented, beginning to enter the academy. Hearing this, both friends jumped on him instantly. And how much? Matsuda asked with great excitement. I'd say it's Tiamat level. She answered the brunette, causing both friends to let out a big, oh, from his lips in response. Oh really? They both screamed, unable to believe it. In the classroom. Issei was looking at the window, watching the clouds go by. The first class had been very boring, where she was only informed about the parents' visit next week, and that from now on some schedules changed due to the change of a teacher. She also talked about certain things about the pool, something she didn't understand, or rather, she didn't want to understand due to her ramblings. Well, it was understandable that he is distracted, after everything that happened to him the day before. The door slammed, causing a rather intense silence to fill the room, something Issei hadn't caught due to his deep thoughts. The noise of the chalk on the blackboard was the only thing that was heard for a short second. I will be your new civics teacher. Hearing the woman's voice, Issei couldn't help but widen his eyes in great shock, to later witness how Penemu was standing there, wearing the secretary dress he had met her in. She ruffled her hair with her hand, adding an even more beautiful touch to her lovely figure. My name is Penemu Lobrega. It's a pleasure to meet you, and I hope we get along well. She clarified the woman, looking away from her on Issei for a short second, something Matsuda caught on instantly. Have you met this cutie before? She asked herself, 
whispering from behind her. She is the woman who acted as guide on my journey. Issei answered him, causing Matsuda's pen to drop to the floor at the answer. He could only think how Issei's bastard could be so lucky. Issei could only look at the woman carefully, and then rub his eyes. Is this real? He wondered, looking closely at the woman in front of him. First Tiamat, and now she. A rather discreet smile spread across the brunette's face. This couldn't be better. The minutes passed. Penemu was in charge of leaving different instructions to her students while she seemed to be signing papers without stopping, and reading different documents. The brown-haired man had thought that he managed to come here, thanks to the fact that he could work at the same time that he gave classes. Obviously, that only made her an even more incredible woman. After all, not many women could do both at the same time. Near the end of the hour, she put on her glasses, letting the brunette understand that this wasn't the first hour she'd been working, and she'd been doing it for a long time. Probably, before coming to the academy, she had already started. Finally, the bell rang, signaling the break. Matsuda and Motohama stayed talking with Issei for a few minutes for different plans in the afternoon, and then went off to buy something. Issei looked out the window with great calm. She was all alone in the classroom. The brown-haired man couldn't help but smile when he saw how Murayama intervened with Matsuda, and they both sat on a bench and began to chat. While Motohama sat next to Aika, seeing that she was eating alone. That made him think that her words had not only affected the ladies, but also her own companions. So here you were. Issei turned around, to see how Tiamat and Penemu entered the room. Issei just smiled happily and quickly got up from his seat giving Penemu a big hug who responded with the same intensity and affection. I had wanted to do this for the whole hour, but it would have been so weird. Issei just laughed at his own words. Believe me me too, Penemu replied, hugging him tighter. What about your birthday? Tiamat asked, sitting down on top of a desk. Issei broke away from Penemu, giving the dragoness a smile. We've already been planning with Matsuda and Motohama. I'm also thinking of inviting Tanon. After all, we've formed a kind of friendship in the time we've been together. Tiamat nodded in agreement. Would it be too much trouble if I also participate? The three of them turned their gaze, to see how Azazel was leaning against the door frame, arms folded while he kept that mysterious smile on his face. Hum, I don't see it as a bother, was Issei's simple response. Very good. Azazel simply nodded in satisfaction, then nodded at him. I need you to come with me, I have to give you something. The leader fixed his gaze on the cadre. You too, Penemu. The aforementioned looked at each other, and then looked at the dragon, who simply bowed her shoulders. At the occult club. Woo. Issei couldn't help but be surprised when he saw a motorcycle leaning against the wall of the old building. It was quite big and had a cool design. Penemu approached, and couldn't help but raise an eyebrow at what she witnessed. Did you buy a motorcycle? The fallen asked, looking at the leader of hers. It is not mine, Azazel declared, before taking a key out of his pocket. Catch. Issei quickly turned around, catching the keys. The brown-haired man couldn't help but look at him with great confusion at the act. It's yours, Azazel stated, causing Issei to blink in great surprise. Happy birthday, she concluded, outlining a somewhat mischievous smile. Wait. I can't accept this, Issei exclaimed, unable to believe what she had heard. I give it to you not only for your birthday, but also for all the trouble Kokobiel caused back then. He explained the fallen with some seriousness, indicating that he would not take, no, for an answer. Hum, Issei sat on the mat, looking at her carefully. I don't know what to say. I just, thank you, really. She concluded herself, giving the fallen a grateful smile. Yeah, yeah, you're going to make me cry, you dynamic brat. Issei couldn't help but roll his eyes at the nickname. Today is Friday. It would be nice if you took the opportunity to take a little trip so that you can get a little clear of everything in general. You know, Azazel commented, making Issei nod in understanding. Besides that, I also have a gift for you, Penemu. Hearing her name, Penemu couldn't help but point to herself. For me, she asked herself, incredulous. I know you've been working forever and because of us, you never had a vacation for even one day. A small smile appeared on Azazel's face. I'll take care of tomorrow's tasks, so you can spend some time with Issei, and also distract yourself from your responsibilities. 
Azazel hunched his shoulders, closing his eyes. But don't get used to it, because I will never do it again in my life. The fallen one commented, causing a small smile to appear on the fallen one's face. She wasn't quite sure if she could trust him when it came to work, but it was clear to her that he was serious when she heard his last words. Wait. They both looked at Issei, who seemed to have a big doubt. I don't even know how to ride a motorcycle. Azazel took an envelope from his pocket and tossed it at the brunette. Here is a map of the nearest beach and the best hotel in the area. I also give you a check for 100,000 yen so you can pay the expenses. According to, Issei's eyes almost bulged out of her sockets upon hearing the exorbitant figure. Even if it's a five-star hotel, the expenses won't even exceed 20,000 yen. Are you crazy? The chestnut exclaimed, unable to believe it. Let's say what you have left over is the second part of the present for your birthday, and for saving Kuo. The fallen one commented quite gracefully after seeing Issei's reaction, since for him, 100,000 yen were nothing. Use the money to buy new clothes. You always wear the academy clothes, even when you train. In fact, I'm sure you don't have many spare parts left. Azazel explained with a serious look. He had been to the chestnut's home earlier to take his photo album, and he recalled that he was shocked when his parents didn't even buy him clothes. Very good, thank you very much. But, Issei looked at him, while sweating. Slightly. You still haven't told me how I should learn to drive in one day. Azazel simply turned around, opting for a nonchalant look. You'll just learn on the wagon. He said casually, then raised his hand, saying goodbye. This guy, Issei thought. Always so carefree about everything. Penemu completed the chestnut's thought. A few hours later, finally, Issei had been able to celebrate his long awaited birthday. There were Matsuda, Motohama, Penemu, Tiamat, Tanan, and Azazel. The chestnut had a great time with his soulmates, having fun with them, telling different stories, and laughing with joy. Incredibly, the one who participated the most in all this was Azazel, recounting his different journeys throughout the planet something that interested Matsuda and Motohama a lot when he talked about the appearances of foreigners and appointments that sometimes led to spicy things. Finally, the brown-haired man sat down at the small picnic, and he couldn't help but smile when he saw how Tiamat was doing everything possible so that Penemu wouldn't burn the meat. They both looked quite happy, so it was quite a refreshing blow to her soul, due to all those two beautiful women had suffered in the past. Seeing them smiling and laughing, it was something simply irreplaceable. Do you always celebrate birthdays in this park? Azazel asked, sitting down next to him. Always since I met Matsuda and Motohama. It's like some kind of tradition. She answered the chestnut with a toothy smile. Azazel just placed a hand on his shoulder, indicating that he was happy to see him so happy. Watch out for the embers. Tiamat arranged a piece of meat that could have been roasted by Penemu, making them both laugh. Hearing the beautiful melodies they made with their laughter, the brown-haired man couldn't help but look at them again. Azazel was no fool, so he caught his eye instantly. What do you think of them? She asked. The question caught the brunette a bit off guard. What do I think of them? Issei looked for a few more seconds at the dragon and the fall, how they played and how they joked with each other. I owe them both everything that I am. She answered, taking Azazel a bit by surprise. Is that answer enough? She asked her, flashing him a rather sincere smile. Although you surprised me with the answer, that's not exactly what I meant. Azazel answered, and then placed his hand on top of Issei's head. I mean what do you think of them? Not as a person, not as what they mean to you. Azazel stared at him, narrowing his eyes slightly. If not, I mean how do you see them as a woman? Issei only chuckled slightly at the question. Well, I'm not stupid. He answered then stared at them. Tiamat has breasts that surpass Akino's without much difficulty, and she has a trained and chiseled figure. She has hair, face, and eyes that are simply perfect. Her legs are also perfect, thanks to her physical figure. And yet, what stands out the most about her body is her butt. Issei turned his gaze from her, looking at Penemu. Penemu's case is exactly the same, although instead of his behind being what stands out the most, it's his breasts. Issei frowned slightly. Still, it's not the most attractive thing I see in them. I just don't know what it is that makes me see them as wonderful women, but I know there's something there. Issei gave a small sigh, 
lifting her hair. I'm still trying to figure it out. A mysterious look graced Azazel's face. Sure, it's pretty obvious what you mentioned. He thought he. After all, any man would be attracted to two women who have a perfect face and body. Anyone could be attracted, but not in love, he concluded, then smiled. I hope you find out soon. He told the brunette, ruffling her hair. Let's take a picture. Tanin yelled happily, quickly running past Matsuda and Motohama to where Issei was to get in the photo. Hearing the cry, Tiamat and Penemu quickly joined them. Finally, the photo made a small flash, which after a few seconds was revealed in a beautiful image. There, was Azazel next to Issei, still stroking his unruly hair with a half-smile, while Matsuda and Motohama came out lying in front, probably because they barely made it in time, while Tanin was sitting next to Issei while hugging his neck tightly with a toothy smile on her face. Behind the chestnut, were the dragon and the fallen kneeling, where Tiamat was smiling completely delighted to have a piece of meat sticking out of her mouth, while Penemu seemed to be threatening her with her hand to take it away. Finally, it could be seen how a book was closed, seeing that it was Issei, who had placed the photo in his album. The brown-haired man simply smiled for a short second, before leaving the memory center on the shelf after hearing the door open. Tiamat practically jumped on top of him, her hair completely wet and in her underwear, indicating that she had recently bathed. It's been a long time since I slept with you. She commented the dragon, then straddled him, flashing a rather mischievous smile as she wiggled her fingers in an odd way. I really missed it. Issei could only laugh out loud as the tickle attack landed on his body again. Even so, the brown-haired man was quite skillful and responded quickly, making them both laugh non-stop for several minutes, rolling around on the bed and spinning around, messing it up completely. Finally, both seemed to have relaxed again, where everything ended as it had started, Tiamat sitting on Issei's waist. They were both breathing a little rough. Issei couldn't help but feel a small tingle as a drop of Tiamat's wet hair fell onto her exposed abdomen. He didn't know how or when it had happened, but the dragon had taken his shirt off at some point during the fight. I think we'd better go to sleep. I have to get up pretty early tomorrow. The chestnut commented. He placed his firm hands on Tiamat's hip to move her. The dragon suffered a small spasm throughout her body after feeling her touch so warm and delicate, something that Issei did not go unnoticed. Are you okay? She asked her with genuine concern. At this, Tiamat couldn't help but grow serious. We have to talk about something very important. The dragon cautiously pushed Issei's hands away, then stared at him. It's a bit embarrassing. But, Tiamat's seriousness didn't last much longer as her gaze twisted to a much more timid one as a rather large blush appeared on her face. All all the dragons have. They have a, Issei couldn't help but file Tiamat's attitude in her most precious memories of hers, since she had never seen her act like that, and she looked quite cute. You see, Tiamat gave a little sigh, to then lay her body down and settle on the chestnut chest. All dragons have a period where they become, very sensitive, to say the least. Mating season. Issei's eyes slowly widened. Wait, are you telling me that you? Yes, I'm going through that period. The dragon clung to Issei even more after his last words. In the mating season, there are times when the reproductive instinct clouds the dragon's judgment and mind, pounced on the first male that crosses her path. Oh, Diedrag thought inwardly, listening to the talk. She was having a lot of fun with this, as she could feel Tiamat's sexual appetite increasing with each passing second. And on top of that, he was finding it very amusing that he lied. Tiamat felt how the hand that was caressing her hair hugged her protectively, making a sweet smile appear on her face. Calm down, Issei. I'm the strongest dragon queen. My mating season isn't strong enough to completely cloud my judgment. The dragon explained, causing Issei's embrace to visibly relax. Still, I'm worried. I can control myself, but not all the time. There will be times when I can't take it anymore, and I'm sure 100% of those times, you'll be near me. After all, we sleep in the same bed. Tiamat looked up from her, her cold blue eyes shining with great intensity. When that happens, you have to go. Couldn't I help you somehow? He asked himself, being affected by the condition of the master and future lover of his. Of course, a rather mischievous smile spread across the dragon's face. If you don't mind being raped. Issei just sweated at the last words. 
The hours passed, and Issei had managed to sleep without much trouble. Tiamat had also found herself very comfortable sleeping on the chestnut's body, feeling her heartbeat. In fact, perhaps he had settled in more than he should have. The dragon's eyes glowed brightly in the darkness as they opened. Her gaze turned somewhat tortuous, at the same time that she began to rub her thighs a little. Asterisk are you enjoying your stay? The dragon's comment came out through the brunette's hand, with a clear mocking tone. What do you want? The dragon asked, frowning. Asterisk you can fool the brat, but I can't. I know very well that female dragons only go into heat for only one man, and they focus on having carnal relations only with that man. The dragon declared smugly. Asterisk have you already forgotten that I'm a dragon too? If you tell him anything, I swear I'll find a way into your filthy gauntlet to emasculate you. Tiamat's dark tone made Didrag laugh. Asterisk don't worry. This is a matter between the two of you, and it's none of my business. The dragon explained, then smiled mischievously. Asterisk you know what? I was almost sure that you had fallen in love with him, but now I have no doubt. You've even managed to awaken your reproductive instinct, since you're not even in a loving relationship with him. The dragon commented with a rather mocking tone, causing the dragon to grit her teeth slightly. I'm crazy about him. I love him with all my being. Tiamat's gaze sharpened on her, indicating danger. Do you have a problem with that, underdeveloped lizard? I never said that, lovelorn dragon. Diedreg couldn't help but laugh again when Tiamat made a small snort before looking away, indicating her annoyance. He had found a way to annoy her, and fuck, he was going to take advantage of it for all the times she'd made fun of him by calling him that insulting name. In the morning, Issei woke up and gave a big drowsy yawn. The brown-haired man couldn't help rubbing his eyes in an attempt to get rid of the dream. He quickly realized that his cute dragon was no longer there, something that seemed strange to him. After all, she loved to sleep, and much more if she was with the chestnut. Issei slipped his hand under the sheets to get them off him, only to hear a strange sound. Hey, the chestnut wondered, to later raise his hand, seeing how a substance of dubious origin covered his hand. It didn't take long for him to realize that it was, because when he separated his fingers, the liquid slipped in a somewhat strange way, in addition to its somewhat viscous texture. The brown-haired man blushed. Not because of the fact that what was in his hand was coming from Tiamat's most intimate area, but because of her scent. How the hell can you smell like mint ice cream? She thought to herself, then shook her head fiercely. The brown-haired man got up quickly and went quickly to the dragon, who was locked in the bathroom. Tiamat, are you okay? Issei knocked on the door, only to blush as he heard some rather intense gasping from the other side. It's just the little problem we talked about yesterday. The dragon commented with a voice so excited that it made Issei stiffen. Go now. Before things get more complicated, the dragon commented, making the brunette feel a little bad. But, we would like you to come with us. Ah Tilda. Issei almost fainted after hearing Tiamat's great moan. Don't worry about me. I have quite an important matter to attend to here. The dragon explained, the hot tone of hers even more risque after her last moan. Issei seemed to doubt it for a small second, but he quickly agreed to her request. The brunette slowly made her way down the stairs, only to stop when she heard Tiamat's call. When you get back, I have to talk to you about something about your club building. She yelled with a somewhat pleading tone. It was strange, since it seemed that she was begging him to enter the bathroom and claim her right there. Even so, Issei took this for granted, due to what the dragon said. What about the club? The chestnut asked, only to be startled when another, even louder, moan tore from Tiamat's lips. He strapped on his backpack and bolted for the door, only to run into Penemu, who apparently was just about to ring the bell. She was wearing a cute tilted straw hat, while she seemed to be wearing a cute flowing white one-piece dress. Penemu opened her mouth to speak, but Issei quickly cut her off. We have to go, he exclaimed somewhat startled, jumping on the bike. Is Tiamat not coming with us? She asked herself, sitting behind him and taking him firmly around the waist. She is busy. It was the chestnut's simple response, to then start the motorcycle, and almost hit a car in progress due to the enormous speed. A few hours later, Tiamat entered Issei's room, closing her eyes with great tranquility before the complete silence. She was in her underwear, so it was implied that she had been in the bathroom all this time. 
Finally, the dragon lay down on the bed. She put her whole body inside the sheets, making various strange movements there, only to see how all her underwear flew off. The dragon poked half of her face above the sheet, closing her eyes deeply and inhaling as much as possible, to catch Issei's fragrance. Now I'll be alone all day, she thought, as she let out her hidden gasps. I have to use all this day to satiate my reproductive instinct. She put the pillow over her head and breasts, beginning to gasp more heavily as she began to slide her hand lower and lower. This will help me, if only for several days, she concluded, before giving a small moan. She slowly removed her hand from the sheets, seeing that she was completely covered in her fluids. I'm already so wet, she told herself, and then her eyes sank with pleasure when she squashed the pillow hard between her legs. My insides are screaming for you to make him happy, Issei. She stammered, as she bit her finger in an attempt to muffle her loud moans. The bed began to creak in a rather absurd way, while the sheets began to shake noticeably with each movement of Tiamat. She directed both her hands towards the pillow, squeezing it tightly against her forbidden zone to feel even more pleasure. And, it was going to be quite a long day for her. Meanwhile, in a place a bit far away, I can't believe we haven't collided once, Penemu commented, as she walked along with Issei on the edge of the beach. She still had her straw hat on, though her dress had changed to her typical white pajamas. It was something natural, because the exaggerated measurements of her breasts always give her a problem when choosing clothes. It's a waste that you're all covered up. She commented the cadre, looking at him sideways. Issei just looked at her with a raised eyebrow. What's wrong with going like this? She asked her. The brunette was wearing a leotard, a thin skin-colored windbreaker jacket, and a white shirt. The hood covered most of his hair. You did a workout that almost killed you. Penemu explained seeing how no woman looked from her to Issei. You're in impressive physical shape. The only thing you're revealing is your legs, and that doesn't leave much to the imagination. I don't care about that kind of thing. Issei kicked the sand, then gave her a smile. The truth is, I've never stood out, and I'd feel quite strange if he started now. It's just not my thing. He finished, receiving a small nod from the cadre, indicating that she understood. Even so, a smile appeared on Penemu's face that only Issei could make out. At least, I think you look good like that, she commented, making the brunette smile at her praise. Look at that woman, it's true, she's beautiful. Why is she with a brat? The whispers of the nearby men caused a small tick to appear in Penemu's eyebrow. Right now, she wished she didn't have such supernatural hearing abilities. What should you have in your pants? Maybe not a he mustn't even know how to satisfy that beauty. When the brat walks away, would you dare to approach him? Maybe she wants an erotic test that isn't with a brat who doesn't even know how to play erotic games, don't you think? Those last whispers exhausted Penemu's patience. The cadre stopped short and clouded her gaze. Issei watched her with slight concern. Penemu, are you okay? She asked herself, moving closer to the fall. If it's because of what they're saying, don't worry. I totally don't care what they think. He declared the chestnut, implying that he was also listening to the stupidities of the men who were close to her. Issei was slightly surprised to see how the cadre looked up, and gave him a sweet smile. She caressed the brunette's cheek. Don't worry, it's all good. She commented herself, making Issei smile and proceed to drink from her bottle. Penemu's gaze flashed brightly from one second to the next. I'm very fine because I know we will have a lot of fun playing doctor when we rent a hotel. All the men and women looked impressed at the woman's comment, while Issei spat out almost all of his drink after hearing her words. In some way that he did not understand, Penemu seemed to have been the one affected by those words, since the gossip was directed only at him. And, obviously, he was not an idiot, and he knew exactly what he meant by, playing doctor. The brunette quickly approached his ear. Penemu, calm down. The chestnut whispered, while he looked around with some nervousness. I cannot do it. The cadre commented with a rather hard look. They're making fun of you, and your manhood. I'm sure you'd be much more of a man than all of them put together, Issei. And I appreciate you thinking so, really. Trust me, I don't care what they say. They're frustrated bastards who haven't had a fulfilling sex life by their imaginary standards. Issei moved away from her a bit, raising both eyebrows. 
do you really think I care what those kinds of people think? Especially if they're strangers I don't even know. Penemu looked at him intensely for a short second, then sighed. Issei smirked at the thought that she had brushed him off. Even so, the cadre had to say that such comments bothered her a lot, and it wasn't because he was her friend, but because she loved him. She could bear that they think badly about seeing a 25-year-old woman with an 18-year-old, after all, they are mere humans. But she wasn't going to stand for Issei being made fun of. Not only because he loved him, and felt that need to defend him, but also because he had a feeling that Issei would be a monster in bed, and his feelings are always correct, therefore, he can't stand being slandered like that. It was incredible for her to listen to how some men made fun of Issei's manhood, since none of them could last more than an hour in action, while the brown-haired man could probably support. Well, her mind wouldn't be able to figure it out exactly, unless she did the test herself. Even so, he knew that that time would be very, very long. His ramblings ended when he heard a comment from another man. Hey, look, she said that very proud a few seconds ago, but the brat isn't even holding her hand. She's probably afraid to touch her body, another whispered gracefully. This was the last straw again for the cadre. Hey, Penemu commented, catching the brunette's attention. Put one of your hands on my butt. Issei rolled his eyes. Don't you think you're taking this too seriously? Penemu tilted her head slightly, blinking once. You think. An almost invisible blush crossed Penemu's face when she felt Issei's hand encircle her waist, catching her in a warm embrace. This is enough, she asked herself, receiving a smile from the fall. Yes, this is more than enough, she whispered, her hands lightly tightening her pajamas when she felt the affectionate gesture. Somehow she didn't understand, those whispers stopped bothering her for the whole afternoon. Several hours later, in a five-star hotel, Issei and Penemu entered the room. It was very small, but it looked very ostentatious. It had a great red design, with a large double bed. There was only a sliding door of an opaque transparency that led to a bathroom, which seemed to be almost as big as the main room. Amazing. She couldn't help but say the brunette, looking at the cool design as he put down his backpack. It's normal, coming from such an expensive hotel. Penemu clarified not looking surprised by the layout of the interior. Issei couldn't help but rub his hair slightly nervously. Too bad there is only one bathroom. We are in a hotel. Penemu sat on the bed, stretching out her legs. Friends don't come here to spend a short stay in precisely the same room. He commented to her, then raised an eyebrow. And what's wrong with only one bathroom? The cadre's question made Issei look at her strangely. A few minutes later, the sound of a drop falling into the tub was the only thing that was heard in the bathroom. Definitely, things had not turned out as Penemu expected. She was outside the tub, placing the shower to one side while she watched as Issei was immersed in the tub, completely covered by a curtain. Can you give me the cream? She asked, as she subtly fixed her hair. The cadre put on a towel, while thinking about the situation. I had heard from Tiamat that they had bathed many times together so I really thought it wouldn't be a problem, he thought, to then look at Issei's figure looking for the cream. But I ignored the fact that Tiamat is a dragon, and in her species it's natural to see the opposite gender naked, so it wasn't unnatural to bathe mixed. Penemu was slightly surprised when a vessel nearly hit his face, trapping him inches from the impact. A small smile appeared on his face as he caught and released the product. I guess I should break the ice. Issei was slightly startled upon hearing Penemu's voice. Issei, what you gave me, it's not cream. Oh I'm sorry. The brown-haired man peeked a bit from his face through the curtain, only to be hit hard in the face by the object that was previously in Penemu's hand. What the hell? Issei didn't finish speaking, since he saw how Penemu threw and caught a soap with a challenging smile on her face. A rather disturbing smile appeared on the brunette's face. So that's what you want to play, huh? He asked himself, then tossed what he was closest to. Penemu dodged it, and quickly returned the attack. Some laughter was dazzled in the bathroom, accompanied by loud noises due to the force that the objects were thrown. The soap was sticking to the walls, the shampoo was beginning to stain the wet floor, and the cream was turning the curtains and the toilet a thick white. The pitched battle continued like this for several seconds, until in one of the many shots, Issei threw a soap with terrible aim and hit the mirror, breaking it on the spot. 
The blow was such that it even opened by sheer inertia. Seeing this, Issei just started to whistle while hiding behind the curtain, as if nothing had happened. The sound of a doorknob was picked up by Penemu's trained ears, so she quickly removed her towel and tossed it into the open mirror, covering it completely. The receptionist who had received them entered the bathroom, looking at them with a smile. Is everything okay? We're hearing a lot of noises. Because of the steam, the woman could not make out very well what had happened inside, but she was sure that Penemu was completely naked, and that the young man she had entered with was behind the curtains of the tub, apparently with a very large erection. S. Sorry to bother you. The receptionist gave a quick apologetic curtsy before leaving. Penemu quickly grabbed another towel and put it on, only to see Issei pull back the curtain, revealing that that supposed boner was just a big container. Good save, he exclaimed the brunette, sticking his thumb up at the fall. She imitated the brunette's gesture with a small smile, before removing the towel from the mirror. His head bounced weakly from being hit by an object causing him to turn his gaze to see a quite determined Issei. What's going on? She asked. We haven't finished the war yet. Another small smile appeared on Penemu's face after hearing her words. The people who were sharing the room next door could only listen in complete amazement as crashing sounds were heard from the other side, followed by laughter and the voice of a woman and a man. On occasion, it could be discerned as saying, Issei, don't push it so hard, or you'll break it. Or like, Next time I'll hit you in the face, Penemu. It seems that our friends are having a pretty good time, the man commented with a somewhat lecherous smile, before jumping towards the half-naked woman. Let's not get left behind. Finally, the minutes passed, and the bathroom was a mess. A complete silence rose in the place, where two bodies rested on the tub, apparently asleep. Both covered by towels. Penemu had her hands and face on the chestnut chest while she seemed to be sleeping peacefully. Issei had her arms around the cadre's back, enclosing her in a tender embrace. Her chin rested on top of Penemu's head, while she accompanied him in her beautiful dream. The bright moon graced the sky, kicking off a rather peaceful night. Penemu was in her pajamas, already tucked in while reading a book. Her reading was interrupted when Issei came out of the bathroom, wearing pajamas that made him look like an inmate. You could see from the brunette's face that he was quite happy to have more freedom in his choice of how to dress. Issei sat on the edge of the bed, setting an alarm on his usual watch. Finally, the brown-haired man looked at Penemu, who had a rather seductive look on her face. In the end, do you want to play doctor? She asked herself, pulling up the sheets in a clear invitation to the chestnut. Issei's face exploded with a strong red, making Penemu laugh sweetly at the brunette's reaction. Don't worry, she answered quickly, hugging Issei and pulling him onto the bed. I was just kidding, she concluded. Issei just shook his head at his teacher's antics, and then tucked himself in next to her. Penemu didn't take even a second to approach him and hug him like he was a stuffed animal. She couldn't help but put her face on top of the brunette's chest, while she gave an inaudible passionate sigh when she felt how Issei's hand began to caress her black hair. Now that I think about it, how do you know about the doctor game? The chestnut asked with great intrigue. I know a lot more erotic games, Issei, the fall answered, snuggling her face even more into the brunette's chest. I am a fallen angel. It is in my nature to be very curious about the things that are considered as sins. Sex is what attracts the most attention, since it is what can generate you the most pleasure, I suppose. In the next room, numerous blows and moans began to be heard making the brown-haired man visibly nervous, unlike Penemu, who found this quite amusing. Even so, I'm not like any other fallen angel. I was able to free myself from my vices and ties, just in time before selling my body to a total stranger for mere pleasure. That's why I'm still a virgin, Penemu looked up, thinking carefully. Though, to tell you the truth, sometimes my lust gets the better of me, and I have to find a way to, free myself. Hearing this last part, Issei couldn't help but blush intensely remembering when she saw Penemu touching herself by accident. But I would never sell my body just for a little pleasure. She concluded her, sitting on top of the brunette's waist. Ah, throughout my life I've had many proposals, but I'll never accept any. Penemu looked up from her for a short second, and then looked at the brunette again. I don't think it's too hard for you to get it. Penemu couldn't help but be surprised at the chestnut's words. Well, I mean, 
you are an exceptional woman and quite unique. I'm sure that at some point, you will find a man who really loves you. Issei positioned one of her hands on the cadre's cheek, and she leaned into her touch without a second thought. Well, at least, I think you're as beautiful on the outside as you are on the inside. Penemu felt how her burning chest transferred an endless amount of pure happiness to her entire body just by hearing Issei's words. He was always so nice to be around that she had almost forgotten what unhappiness was. Simply, she felt so complete when she was next to her, that she never wanted to be separated from her. Even those words made her cheeks dye a deep red, at the same time that she gave him a smile as pure as her feelings. Penemu slightly lowered her gaze, while placing a hand on Issei's, to make sure that the heat she felt on her cheek did not disappear. You're very sweet with your words, seriously, the blush on her face was noticeably controlled, probably because of what she was about to say. But, after everything I've done in my life, it's not a happiness that I deserve. I don't deserve to be loved, much less do I deserve to love. Issei opened his mouth to contradict that instantly, but was stopped when Penemu placed one of her fingers on his lips. Still, I managed to be happy. Something I never thought I would feel again. Penemu put her hand to her chest. I made a great friend in Tiamat. Besides, these last two months not only left me with her, but you also appeared. Penemu gave her such a beautiful smile that she blushed slightly at her brown hair. That blush intensified when Penemu lay on her chest. Do you remember that before you had told me that I was one of the most valuable people for you? Well, the same is true for me. You are irreplaceable for everything you have done for me, for how you have helped me, for how you have listened to me, for all that, and much more. Issei was surprised when Penemu brought her lips to his cheek, giving him a fleeting and shy kiss, which meant much more than it seemed. For all that, I love you very much. Penemu hugged the brunette tightly, placing her head just below his chin. It's not the same as love, but it's a kind of happiness. A kind of happiness that fills me completely. That's why I don't care much about love as long as we're together. As long as we continue to experience such fun or exciting things together with Tiamat, I'm sure I'll be happy forever. Issei was left speechless by what the cadre said. She only deigned to hug her back, making her feel even happier. The moans and thumps from the next room got even louder, but somehow those sounds didn't reach Issei or Penemu, who fell asleep in each other's arms, while a pure and harmonious smile delighted on their faces. That was a picture to think about. Such a pure love was presented between the two of them, that it completely overshadowed the union that the people in the next room were having. They did not need to unite their bodies to match them, just with their love so pure, it already surpassed them. That's how it is. A love so great and pure, that Issei and Penemu did not want to see. The next day, Penemu was sitting on the sand, inches from the water. She enjoyed the total silence, except for the noise of the waves. How calm he is today, Issei commented, sitting next to him. It's very early, was Penemu's response, without taking her gaze away from the waves. Issei looked at her face for a few seconds, seeing how such a cute smile remained on her face. This was gratifying to him, though he couldn't help but feel a little bad for her. It's a pity we have to go back so quickly, the brunette commented, imitating Penemu's look. Maybe, he replied. A silence settled in the environment for a few seconds, until finally Penemu rested her head on the brunette's shoulder. It has been a day full of emotions and memories. She deeply closed her eyes, leaning her body against the chestnuts. Thank you very much, Issei. He didn't even look at her. He just kept looking at the waves, while he wrapped his hand around Penemu's waist, pulling her closer to him. Donata. End of chapter.